Hello, good morning and welcome to our webinar. The topic is rapid recovery of, from failure, Kubernetes clusters with continuous restoration capability. Uh, brought to you by Mirantis and Trilio. And just to, just to introduce our presenters, um, here's us, uh, Stefan from Trilio and myself, Ben Dorman. Um, Stefan, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, my name is Stefan. I'm based in Germany. I work for Trilio since uh, about two years. And yeah, I'm Director of Product Marketing and uh, happy to be here today. And I'm Ben Dorman. I'm coming to you from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. I've been with uh, Mirantis for about 18 months. And I work with uh, partners such as Trilio to forge business solutions that involve Mirantis and the partners' products. So. Let's give you an overview of where we're going today. Um, we're going to start talking a little bit about the context in which we're operating. What is disaster recovery when you need it and why what we're going to talk, talk to you about today is really important. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the cloud native technology and why um, these solutions really uh, depend on the, the features of cloud native work. And then because we are a software company called Mirantis, we're gonna show you the Mirantis platform, even though we're gonna also show you how strongly dependent everything we do, we're talking about today is on open source capabilities. Uh, after which I'm gonna hand over to uh, Stefan and he's gonna talk about uh, data protection and intelligent recovery uh, from Trilio. And then he's gonna show you the continuous recovery demo, which is the feature of this presentation. Okay, so let's get going. Um, disaster recover, recovery and rapid recovery. Why do we need to talk about recovery? Well, <laughs> we always ask the question, what could possibly go wrong? And right down here, I've got five bullet points that talk about different things that can go wrong with your data center. Um, so these are listed because each of them requires a different response. And you have to think through what it is you would do if, if any of these things happen. In some ways, the smoking hole scenario where some, where a fire or a bomb hits your uh, data center is the, the, the most straightforward because you know you have to just move everything elsewhere. There's no um, dispute about what you have to do. Whereas some of these others, there's going to be some kind of process to determine what I need to do to recover. For example, if the network to your data center is down, um, do you need a full recovery? Um, can you afford to keep uh, uh, keep the, the um, applications down until it comes back? Well, it will depend on how long. Someone has to make a decision about that. Ditto something like ransomware when someone's hijacked all of your, all of your precious data, what do you do? Um, what is the response? Um, and again, um, partial and total data loss are handled differently. Um, how much data loss can you can you tolerate? So those are the kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, but the important thing is that you plan for what to do if any of these things happened. What what applications you have are important, and which order would you want to recover them? Uh, most people are familiar with the abbreviations RPO, recovery point objective, which refers to how much data loss, how, how long, um, what chunk of the data that has been stored in your data center can you afford to lose. And recovery time objectives, RTOs, how long do you, do you require to get back up and running? Um, we've heard of people companies who have such sensitive data owing to the possibility of um, things like chemical leaks and so on, that they, they really need their data you know, back within a, a, a few seconds. Um, once you have decided that, you need to prepare your infrastructure for recovery. What are, you, what are you gonna set up so that you can get back and running? And you're going to have to both define exactly what you do in the case of disaster and exercise them um, and so so that you you know that if it 
if something does happen, something goes wrong. I, I started having to think about this kind of pr problem about uh, just under 20 years ago. And uh, the company I was working for at the time had got elaborate one, two, and three. They knew what they needed to recover. And they knew, um, and they, they, they prepared hardware for doing so, but they had no clue about actually how to actually put it into practice until they, and so they instituted exercises to do that. Um, I wanted to point out that if you look at this important document, the NIST cybersecurity framework goes into the kind of planning for recovery that you need to do and all of the steps you ought to take. Um, I can hit the link if you like, um, or maybe later, but the key thing I wanted you to know is that um, the software that we're, we're talking about today um, satisfies quite a few of the prescribed um, uh, procedures you should put in place given by that security, uh, cybersecurity framework. Today's solution, today's um, presentation uh, talks about the technical solutions, the technical part of this. Once you have done all of this planning, how do you actually execute a restore? Um, and because it also um, provides for um, regular backups and regular scheduled um, recoveries, it allows you to actually do the exercise of testing that the cybersecurity framework uh, recommends. So in sum, it's important to understand that recovery is not just making sure you have backup. It's all of this planning that needs to go into, all the planning about what you would do for partial and total uh, losses, and all the planning you should do for the different applications you have in your environment. So now I want to turn to what it is that you that, that cloud native technology provides for this. If we look at what cloud native technologies mean, um, this is how the Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, defines it. They empower organizations to build and run scalable operate applications in modern dynamic environments. Without reading all of this out loud, um, we know all about the hyperscalers, um, AWS, Azure, Alibaba, Google, uh, IBM, so on and so forth. But none of the definition actually requires that you run on these uh, um, platforms. There are private and hybrid options available as well. And the key thing is what the technology that you deploy on those platforms actually provides. So um, if I can summarize quickly all of that, cloud native strategies include containerization, dynamic orchestration, the ability to um, uh, change which containers are connecting to each other at any one time, auto scaling, allowing them the number of instances to um, increase or decrease based on demand or other criteria, and microservice oriented in the sense that containers uh, are recommended to run essentially one application each, although there are good reasons to change that sometimes. Um, but the idea is that you have indivisible small primitive um, units of work that are executed on different containers. The containers themselves are redundant, meaning it doesn't matter if one of them dies, uh, the orchestration framework will spin it up again and immutable. Um, the, as, they, as they execute, uh, the, the actual image and memory is unchanged. So that means that the persistent data storage is separated from the applications themselves. It's, it's also dynamically provisioned. And um, that is one of the key features that makes the data storage actually uh, mobile, can be placed anywhere and moved and re-referenced dynamically. It's expected that the future will be hybrid. We have hyperscalers. We also have private data centers, which can hold host cloud native environments that support this technology. Um, container orchestration is key. That's containerization plus dynamic orchestration. And the two most uh, common uh, orchestrators are Kubernetes and Swarm. Kubernetes being uh, dominant and Swarm making somewhat of a comeback. 
Um, and then you need an infrastructure framework that allows you to provision the servers that um, uh, the containers run on. And examples are OpenStack and uh, VMware. So let's talk a little bit about Mirantis. We're going to talk today about uh, a, a solution. The solution is deployed on Mirantis OpenStack for Kubernetes. Um, we're using Mirantis's Kubernetes engine, but uh, which is compliant with uh, Kubernetes 1.24, I believe, at the moment, and managed by Mirantis Co Container Cloud. Uh, Mirantis Container Cloud is a framework for deploying and um, managing clusters and providing some software to them. Um, the second element of this is off-platform physical storage because backups need to be in a different place by, by almost by definition. Um, we, in Kubernetes, using Kubernetes capabilities, we have storage classes and volume snapshots, which are supported by the standard, and they conform with the container storage interface. Um, the backup and restore capability is pro being provided by Trilio, which you'll see shortly. Um, and finally, the CSI implementations, container storage interface. Well, they're another piece of open source software. Um, you, you'll notice all the red, the red text is for anything that's open source here. So we have been looking at two for this purpose, OpenEDS um, and the CStore um, implementation, which supports volume snapshots and Ceph, which also supports uh, CSI. Um, another possibility is Portworks, uh, which is a proprietary offering, which is also compliant with the C CSI standard. So let me give you a quick demo of the Mirantis capabilities. I've got a short video, which I'm gonna talk you through, that's going to demonstrate these things. Um, we're gonna look at the OpenStack console, um, the Container Cloud Manager, uh, show how multi-tenancy works, um, and uh, without going into reading all of that up, we're going to end up with uh, a quick demonstration of the Lens um, software, which allows you to introspect and operate uh, sets of Kubernetes clusters together. So here's the video. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit over it. It's not uh, got any sound. Um, so this is the OpenStack um, Horizon console, which we're going to sign into. And the first thing we're going to see is the instances. The um, it, it's allowing us to provision um, virtual machines. And OpenStack is historically a product uh, of NASA and uh, Rackspace, and it was intended to be an open source version of AWS, actually. So you'll see all of these uh, instances starting KAAS node, Kubernetes as a, as a service. And then you'll see this is a server. Those are all provisioned by Mirantis Container Cloud. And this is a an extra one with, which we can use to um, a VM that's just been deployed to uh, um, monitor and manage those. Uh, you, it's running Ubuntu desktop, and it allows us to um, view the, the internals of the cluster. So um, this is that's just what all of that looks like. Now we're going to have a quick look at Container Cloud. Container Cloud has been deployed also on OpenStack, and we're going to log into that. And we're going to see, um, first of all, the, 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 the management cluster. The new version has these nice prompts that tell you what's going on. Um, these are the two clusters, primary and secondary, that we have deployed. Uh, um, Trilio on. The, you can see there are different projects. Those are different namespaces that support multi-tenancy. And the default namespace has a management cluster in. The management cluster has three control plane nodes, no worker nodes. And what all of that does is provision other clusters and, and send software to them, such as upgrades and so forth. Um, the clusters were actually going to Oh, sorry. The next thing we're going to do is show you how you create a new project for a new tenant. Uh, you can just give it a name. It takes a few minutes to get that working, but because if I now look at that namespace, there's no there's no cluster item then. But in, in a few minutes, um, which I probably 
removed for the purpose of this video um, that will appear. So in the meantime, we can look at this primary and secondary. These are the clusters we're going to use in the Trilio demo coming up. The primary is where we're going to deploy software, and the secondary is where we're um, returning to. Uh, yeah, we're still a little bit early, but yeah, I thought I'd cut this piece out. Um, but if I hit refresh, nope, still not. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Back to back to new project. Yes. All right. Now, now new project has the clusters item, and I can now go and create a cluster. Um, we'll go up to the create cluster in the in the, in the corner. Uh, but first, before we create cluster, we have to provide credentials. Um, so the credentials are essentially username and password so that you can sign into whichever cloud platform you are trying to build a cluster on. Um, and so um, Container Cloud can uh, manage uh, clusters in multiple data centers. You just have to give it different credentials. Um, sorry. Here we go. There's our there's our updated um, updated um, credential file with the um, with the password in it. Okay, so we're going to upload that one, and give it a name. New cluster credential or something like that. And there it is. And so once we have credentials, we can now create create clusters. Um, so we'll uh, do create cluster. And we'll give it a name. We're going to call it new cluster. Clever. Um, it's on OpenStack, but other providers can possible like VMware or um, there's a provider for bare metal. And so now we have now the cluster is regarded as created, but it can't do anything until we tell it which machines we're going to put on there. So we're going to create three control plane nodes, and we're going to put them in a pool called control plane, probably. Um, right, and then we're going to create three, a couple of worker nodes. That's the minimum. Um, and we're going to enable the logging, monitoring, and alerting framework called Stacklight that Morantis provides with Container Cloud. And you'll see that now the machines are marked as pending. Okay. Now, um, if I go to Lens, I can actually see segue to this. Stefan's going to mention a bit about this before, but these are the clusters that we have um, provisioned uh, for the, the purpose, the primary and secondary. And we will quickly show you that uh, you can see the nodes um, being available. And also you'll see at the bottom that for any any object, you can see the YAML file, and you'll be able to see also the logs for all of those clusters. And you see these clusters are provisioned in Container Cloud, whereas in um, uh, since we just did that, the new cluster is on its way. Some of it's provisioned, some of it's uninitialized. And it will take about 20 minutes or so to, to create a cluster. But all you had to do was to create that was to uh, simply um, pick a couple of buttons. And now if I go back to OpenStack, you'll see that more RAM is used up 
Um, and so Container Cloud has gone to OpenStack and provisioned five new plus five new servers, which are um, available, which are only one minute old. So uh, final thing before I hand over, if I now go back to Container Cloud, Um, I can go back to the, not that one, the new project, and I should have it's already up and running um, with the with the five um, with the five cluster uh, with the five nodes ready to go that I uh, started up about an hour ago. Okay, um, Stefan is now going to talk about Trilio and continuous recovery. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the great introduction. And this uh, presentation of Ben's is the perfect foundation for the work of Trilio. So I would like to share my presentation as well. So Trilio and this intelligent recovery platform is basically building on top of Ben's MKE environment, multi-MKE environment managed by uh, Miranda's Container Cloud. And we are basically using, before we start into my presentation, we're basically using everything which is managed by the platform, by MKE. So they are doing the heavy lifting. And we are just another very helpful application on top of Ben's infrastructure. It could be, in this case, it's a multi-cluster architecture, and it can be also hybrid, as, as Ben mentioned. But what is actually Trilio? I mentioned before, it's an intelligent recovery platform because there are a lot of tools they can do backup, backup of something. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was copying a file from A to B and big hopes afterwards uh, if you can actually recover your file because everything had to be very identical and an identical twin, to be honest, if it uh, should work. But these days it's completely not applicable because things are very, very much agile. You have a lot of different distributions, hyperscalers, you have a lot of different storage providers and hardwares underneath. So to have the identical twin on your backup side, on your code standby side or something is very rare because you, everybody wants to be agile. Everybody wants to save costs maybe to have a, you know, a cheaper hardware vendor here as compute nodes, storage nodes, these kind of things. So the actual recovery platform has to handle that. And that is basically the way of saying, okay, an intelligent platform should be able to, to cover all of these complexities, which the normal user don't want to have every, anything to do with, right? Because this is something, this is our task. As you see, um, the main platforms is uh, Kubernetes and OpenStack. And in this case, we also support both products of Mirantis and all the others, because maybe you want to swap between them. Mm. So let's have a look about Trilio for Kubernetes, because we're talking about Mirantis Kubernetes engine. So we're talking about Trilio for Kubernetes. What is our product? Our product is a software which you basically install like a normal application. It's not a SaaS software. It's a regular software just installed on MKE, like a regular application, as I said. It's agentless, so you don't need to install any agents to your applications or your workloads. If you do a backup, it's non-disruptive. Nobody wants to have a five-hour downtime or something for taking a backup. And it is built the same way. It's designed for the cloud. It's built for the cloud. It's built on the cloud, which should inherit all the very important topics like multi-cluster, self-service, mm -hmm. no bottleneck, if the cloud scales, Trilio scales. So everything which is basically normal these days and which you would expect from an application. And the last bit is very important. We use a as our backup format, which is basically, you know, including your data, customer's data, sensitive data. It is an open universal schema, which is a QCode 2 image. So you can use all the scanning tools you have for viruses and malwares. You can mount it to a Linux if you don't like Trilio anymore. So it's a very trans transparent way of backing up in a certain format your your data. So there is no self-invented proprietary format nobody can read and handle and you need Trilio to read it. Now it's a you know proven since many years in the Linux world QCO2 image format. So what are we talking about today? Before we dive into the demo later on, let's explain what is actually the difference. As I mentioned before, many years ago, uh, the data-centric recovery was actually the uh, <coughs> 
the way the way to go. And yeah, basically, people were just caring about disks and data, and uh, for example, um, taking a snapshot of a VM or these kind of things. But this is just the halfway, right? This is just half of the thing you should have these days to recover entire application landscapes, for example. So the world has changed, as written on the board. You need an intelligent way. You need a smart way of, of recovery. And what does that actually mean in a, in a, a short uh, summary? So the method should be intelligent. So from an administered service kind of somebody has to do it, an expert, and backup expert or something, a silo team has to do it with you know, superpowers on storage level. But in most cases, they have no clue about the application. They are doing jobs from a ticket system. And if they have to recover something, they have to ask somebody to test it. So it should be self-service, right? Same for the responsiveness. So the ticket is there. You know, the backup team is maybe the bottleneck because they're overwhelmed with a low amount of work uh, because we're talking about DevOps these days. So there are multiple different uh, requirements when it comes to uh, backup and recovery. So it should be automated. It should be you know, self-service or orchestrated even. So talk about orchestration. You know, back then it relies on experts. They know exactly what to do. They had maybe spaghetti code in place or some scripts or something like that. These days, Ben mentioned it, we're talking about orchestration tools like, you know, Chef, um, Salt, uh, <coughs> Terraform, these kind of things. So basically, we, we can use that. We can leverage that. So... Same for the data. Um, if we talk about applications back then, you have to know what well, this guy's or the old method is. You have to know what to back up. And maybe there's a mistake. Maybe you forgot half of it. Um, there, were, there were two disks instead of one, or you forgot about the metadata. If you do it the intelligent way, there is an automated discovery of what is actually application and what belongs to it. And then you can test it, you can prove it, and you can bring evidence. Recovery time. You know, because you do it manually and by a certain person and the other person is doing it differently, it's kind of unpredictable. If you do it automated, orchestrated, you test it, you, you can actually see what's happening and you can prove it as well um, to, for example, uh, regulators. Now, if it comes to compliance, you need, um, you need evidence to these authorities saying, hey, we have done the backup, it's orchestrated, it's written in a policy, it's exactly doing this, and this is the evidence. And this is what they need. They need something written down and there is no variation in it because there's no human intervention. It has been defined by humans, but it's done by uh, machines. So basically, <clears throat> basically, there's no way around to make any um, mistakes. Okay, let's come to the, to the last one. Last one, but my slide goes forward, is the topic of use cases. Um, we're talking about using Trilio for backup and recovery. Obviously, we're a data protection platform. We are also talking about disaster recovery. So basically the most urgent case of a backup and of a recovery. So in most cases to a completely different cluster. Uh, also application mobility, in case you would like to move your applications from one platform or maybe on-premise to a different platform uh, on one of the hyperscalers, for example, so you can move entire applications. This is basically a backup and a recovery, but in a, in a let's say, intended way. Same for migrations. Um, um, one of the biggest examples always, if you have different uh, versions of a cluster, you have updated your cluster here, and uh, you have a new cluster with a new major version there, you have tested it, and then you can move and migrate your applications over. And also a big topic these days. Last year was a big spike in the you know in cases. Uh, also this year, uh, ransomware. So you would like to recover from ransom, uh, from ransomware. Um, we are also there uh, and support this and, and can help you with that. So now in terms of Trilio, let's let's dive a little bit more into the kind of uh, architecture, and then later on going into uh, the demo. Okay, what is what is Trilio actually from an architecture uh, perspective? So imagine we have cluster number one, like in our demo later on, and you have an application running um, on that cluster. It's a, in this case, let's assume this is a um, database application, and this database application is being backed up to, for example, an S3 bucket on Amazon, for example. 
but all the ingredients. So not only the data, also the metadata, because people spent a lot of time defining all the you know, secrets and config maps and whatever. So a lot of work went into it. So it's the same way because it made the application available. So that's also very important to understand. It's not only the data is there. In, in most cases, your customer wants to access the data. So it needs parts, it needs secrets, it needs everything which makes this data available to customers. Because otherwise you have restored maybe your persistent volume, but nobody can access it. So the service is not up and running, customers not happy. So imagine something goes wrong. You can take one of the backups or parts of the backups and restore to cluster number one, and everything is fine. As you said, you can retire and you can uh, restore the entire application or bits and pieces of it to a new namespace or to the old namespace. It's completely up to you. But now imagine this cluster is down or it's untrustworthy because maybe you had a ransomware attack. You can also take the same backup and restore to a different cluster. The only thing you need is basically have this cluster ready, have MKE installed, install Trilio. It's basically one command and then tell Trilio where's the backup. That's the only thing you need. So there's no need of backing up the backup application configuration. Everything we need and all the you know, configurations of your application is on that backup target, so nothing, so Trilio itself is stateless, um, which is very handy when it comes to you know, time pressure and these kind of things. Now we're diving into continuous restore, and we are, the topic today is rapid recovery from failure. And we're talking about rapid recovery, there's time pressure, there's maybe a, a loss of business and these kind of things. And Ben also dived into it. What is, oh, I see there's a typo, RTO versus RPO. So RTO basically is a measure of the amount of data that the business can afford to lose. So for example, I can lose maximum two hours, 10 hours maximum. This is what is being tolerated and uh, maybe by, by, by government, whatever compliance uh, rule set. And when it comes to RPO, this refers to the amount of time your organization can afford to lose, the follow, uh, lose following a disaster until business operations can resume. So how long does it take to basically be back alive, be back online? And this is you know, basically um, uh, equal to your SLA. If you, you know, say to your customers, your service, uh, we, we, we promise you your service will be up for a certain uh, percentage and you have to solve that. And this is basically the RPO value. And this is where Trilio also covers both things, but continuous restore especially is pointing to the RPO. So what does that actually mean? Because we have to understand what actually influences these kind of values in an, in an urgent uh, disaster, for example. Uh, first of all, if you have a disaster or one of one of your services down, who's actually doing the recovery? So process-wise, it has to be clear: is it automated? Do I have to do anything, or is it you know so I have to call somebody? Is there an on-call duty? Or these kind of things. So it takes takes some time. Then, how fast is the bandwidth from, for example, the backup location to the target cluster, or from one cluster to another cluster? So these kind of things can play a role if the cluster is far away on a different region, for example. The amount of data, are we talking about one application with just one gigabit, uh, one gigabyte of data, or is it hundreds of applications which are business critical? And also this source cluster, which is apparently down, uh, is that maybe completely different to the target cluster, to my code standby backup cluster somewhere, for reasons, uh, for, for good reasons. Um, the complexity of it, as I mentioned before, is it maybe a different version? Has it used different storage classes? And is there a completely different uh, situation up there? And also, how likely is it that somebody maybe with well, manual intervention makes mistakes? Um, as I mentioned before, uh, if it's tested, proven, automated, um, it should be tested before. No, but nothing should go wrong. But if something like a human has to change something in the configuration before restore and stuff, that's maybe. Um, a point where potential mistakes can happen, and so on and so forth. So there are just some examples what can happen, and then you have no time. You have pressure. Customers, you know, are complaining. Uh, maybe you're tomorrow you're in the newspaper, right? So that's something to avoid and to also incorporate into your um, into your thinking. Now let's talk about continuous restore in action. 
So what is continuous restore? Continuous restore is basically a in an enhanced feature of our you know portfolio, staging data on your clusters um, to be used in, in case of an emergency. So you save the time of transferring over the data in an urgent situation. So what will happen? What we need is we need TVK, so Trillio for uh, Kubernetes, installed on all these clusters. Obviously, we need the Trillio logic there. We define a policy, which is a regular policy in Trillio. There's just another sub-menu defining the continuous restore policy. So that's not an additional feature. If you, if you are able to use Trillio, it's all in. You can use all the features. And we store regularly the backups on the, in this case, S3 bucket or blob storage or Google storage on your backup repository in the middle. And then the clusters on the right-hand side will check, hey, is there a new backup for me? Is there something, is there some data I have to stage on my, on my storage nodes or something to be able to recover in actually no time? Because this link could be, you know, small link. You just, you know, it, it, the higher the data is, you would like to restore an urgent um, case, the more you have to wait. Uh, and, you know, there are just some things you could easily erase out of the equation. So this, how does it look like? We store the data and then we distribute them basically to your, can be one, two, three, or maybe hundreds of clusters. And we stage the data there waiting to be activated. So imagine you have maybe a database, MySQL database, which is important or some other stuff. And it has maybe already 10 gigabytes. Imagine maybe how long it takes 10 gigabytes just to transfer over the data manually or in that uh, specific moment, if you can save that time, save it. And it makes things easier and uh, you are service up and running much more quickly. So now let's see how our demo setup looks like. As Ben already shown, we have a primary MKE cluster and we have our backup uh, repository. In this case, we used AWS S3 and we created two buckets. One is the event bucket, which is used by Trilio for coordinating the continuous restart policy, so Trilio internal communication. And one is the backup target where your backups are being stored. And we have one secondary MKE cluster as a potential target. Could be, as I mentioned, much more. In this case, for the, the sake of being, you know, having a good overview, we just use this one. What we did is we have one application, in this case, a MySQL application, a small one, 200 megabytes big. And we staging, we, we took in total four backups. And as you see here, it's stored there. And then the cluster says, hey, there is a new backup for me. I have to stage them on site because we defined the policy saying four is the minimum I would like to have here, just in case. Um, can be one full, can be three incrementals or four full backups, completely up to you. And we have them ready to be restored on that side. Okay. We call it consistent sets. So this a consistent sets is basically equals a backup. So a, one backup consists, uh, one consistent set, which includes your persistent volumes, your, your actual data. So there's no metadata, so no secrets and something like that involved. It's currently covering the actual data, which is the biggest um, amount of data in this case. Then let's go to the next slide, which is actually my demo video. So this is our Trilio application view. You see a lot of uh, uh, labeled application in the middle. And we have our Kate's demo app application and we create a backup plan. A backup plan is basically the policy, what has to be backed up, where. So we have to go to the uh, certain namespace. We give our backup plan a name, can be any name or following a certain naming convention, and we select our target where it should go through. We also have a feature where you can actually backup the used container images, just in case you wanna make 100% sure, even if the repo is down, we would like to be able to restore um, the container images. But in this case, for the sake of the speed, 
and uh, saving capacity. We, we're skipping this case. You can also put in all the scheduling policies for scheduling regular full incremental backups and also retention policies like you do for every um, uh, backup solution. We see our application here again. And in the next context, we see, hey, we have the so-called remote TVK instances. So main is the one we are currently at. And the secondary is our target cluster, where Trillia should stage the data to be able to be restored. And on the right-hand side, we have the continuous restore policy, which defines how many data sets, consistent sets, you would like to stage on that, on that app. This will be created now. Takes a second. And the uh, continuous restore plan will be stored on this one and also on the event target I've mentioned before, because from there, when there is a backup also available, the other cluster will see, okay, there's a backup available. I have the configuration from that event target. I know what to do because I know I have to stage four consistent sets there. And yeah, basically it's doing its, its job. So now we are executing one backup based on that backup plan. And I copy it because I would like to do uh, three additional ones for the sake of our demo here. So what happens now? We're taking a meta snapshot, which is important to note. This is the place where all the metadata, everything which belongs to the application, was on secrets, config maps, whatever you have defined, the port configuration, everything, and also the data, the actual peer persistent volume will be. So you see the entire application, so truly is application centric, because that is what matters. You would like to restore your entire application, your entire workload, your service, whatever you have there, the entire thing, not only the data, because you would like to have a comprehensive backup here. And at the end, uh, I fast forwarded a little bit, and we up uploaded the, the data and the metadata to our backup repository target. And at the end, all the workers, the all worker uh, containers will be cleaned up. So we do not leave anything on your cluster. It's just on demand for security reasons. So now we see in the backup plan section that our continuous restore backup plan is in progress. So it's doing its job. And we see, okay, the first backup is there. Perfect. It's available, which is always a good thing. And we also have our first uh, overview. Now it's in progress. We will see in a second that I have created three additional ones. So we have in total our four consistent sets. See also statistics. There we go. Outbound means from the main, it's outbound. And our target, there will be the data shown in the inbound section. So it has now four consistent sets um, existing on the cluster. So it's staged, it's there. It's kind of hidden, let's say, um, able to be uh, used for our restoration uh, in case something happened. This could happen manually or orchestrated, automated. You see here on the secondary cluster or target cluster, these uh, inbound consistent sets are available. And you see them here. Um, they're all available status, so they can be used for a recovery. This is what we do. We restore now because we have an urgent scenario. In this case, I do it manually for, for the sake of showing. Um, now you give the restore name and also select the restore namespace where this application should be placed to. Looks like I couldn't decide what, what to do first. I'm always very patient with creating names. There we go. And also select the namespace. We have a lot of switches here, which we can use for a variety of different uh, use cases. In this case, we leave it uh, on default. And we start the restoration process. And we will see now that Trilio really is validating, OK, do we have that consistent set available? OK, cool. Do we have the metadata? OK, what does the metadata says? Does it have this, uh, the image already included? Or does it need to be downloaded from a repository? In this case, it will be the repository. 
we'll see the validation is done. And in this case, only the metadata will be restored because we have the data already there. So you save the time of downloading it from somewhere. So it's a big, big, big benefit in this case. Pots will be spinned up and, and secrets and all the necessary bits and pieces get created and the data will be basically mounted um, to the um, pods. So now we go into the namespaces and we check for our restore um, namespace, which we have created. I named it quickly app restore or quick app restore. And we check the labels and we see that our backup application has been recovered. Let's see what's in there. So the application details, we see we have secrets, deployments, replica sets, service, system volume claims, and uh, in total four ports created. Now, um, Ben mentioned already, let's see how this looks like on Lens, because you can also use Lens um, for the sake to you know, see multiple different things on at a glance. So in this case, you see the notes, Ben already explained that. And we can also see all the Trilio CRDs at the bottom. In this case, we see if we go into the right namespace, our sample application on the, on the source cluster, you can you know, grab all the information you need, you can edit things. We see all our backups we have done so far, including our four backups for our, for our continuous restore. When, how, how big. Um, we also see our targets, event target, and our backup target sizes. And now we're switching to the secondary cluster. And we will see our continuous restore policy, basically defining what the um, what this cluster should do, how, how many consistent sets it should uh, maintain. And also, a lot of information, uh, as I said, at a glance, you don't have to type hundreds of commands in. We see our consistent sets here, the sizes and the availability, the creation times, timestamps, these kinds of things, which can be very um, interesting. And at the end, quite interesting, you can also edit all the things you see basically with a very beautiful, I like that, a colorful uh, scheme here to identify things much easier than maybe with other terminal emulations. You can save and edit things. So quite handy um, for, for all different kind of cases. And we also see our application live here in this context, in the pod context, uh, as I mentioned before, four pods, including the MySQL pod, um, uh, you know, happily running. So we have basically survived our our disaster in this case. Okay, don't want to check it again. Let's go to the next one. Um, yeah, that, that's basically it. So we have actually seen that in this case, you can save a lot of time, especially when you handle very, very big, uh, large amounts of, of data and would like to restore them quickly without waiting um, for things to be up or downloaded, wherever you want to see it, uh, from multiple different locations. So you can save that time um, by having these um, data staged and waiting to be um, to be uh, used in, in this case. Uh, if you're interested in um, in certain types, uh, just go to the Mirandas and also the Trulli website. Uh, there is a lot of uh, content regarding the partnership and support the products of uh, Mirandas, and we are also linking to the Mirandas pages. So um, have a look, and also we have a YouTube channel where we, you know, store all these kind of webinars and other webinars we had and run this also. Um, yeah, and if you want to know more about continuous restore or other features, um, feel free to reach out to us. We are at ten fifty five. Thank you for listening, and uh, we hope you found it formative and useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>